can advertise so people know exactly what the sort of heading is. Uh, there's no uh, uh, great secret information about this. There, there is information out there in the public domain, which is what I've had to go and sort of look for. I don't have any inside running on this particular project. So um, we will just make, uh, there we go. So the Rana Plaza collapse. So why this and why now? So um, it was about, uh, probably about May this year, because I think I recall this occurring, because it's uh, 10 years ago now, that, that, that this particular disaster occurred. And it, uh, and it all of a sudden crept off on me, oh, it's actually 10 years ago that this actually happened. We don't hear, tend to hear much about it. One would hope that the, that the information would become more available, that uh, investigations would have been done, that there'd be things to learn. And, uh, and I thought, and also 10 years, you know, considering that it was such an horrendous event, over 1,100 people died like that, just in an instant. And I thought it's just a, it, oh, you know, for their sake, it actually warrants some attention and there needs to be good things that are brought out about this. Just to give you a sense of scale, uh, so this building in the foreground, you can count that's uh, one, two, three, four, five stories, that one there. So the building that collapsed was eight stories where you can see all the mess. So it would have been well in excess of the height of the surrounding buildings there. Um, and obviously that's after the event, lots of people gathering around. Um, so, why now? Well, as I, said in the, um, as I said in the announcement for the event, it's cited as the deadliest accidental structural failure in modern history. Okay, this is the, uh, I don't know, does anyone recognise this? So this is the Champlain Towers in Miami, which uh, had a very high profile, possibly because it came from the USA. Uh, collapsed in uh, June 2021. Uh, it was actually a much bigger building, and they've since demolished the other half of the tower as well, because it was all unsafe. A bigger building which collapsed, but few people in it. So not that we're trying to run a competition here, but just to give you a sense of the scale involved. Uh, that also was, it was a total collapse without warning. That itself will make a wonderful FISA presentation one day. I'm sorely tempted to do that. But that doesn't take the award for what we're talking about tonight. There's a lot more things that come out of that. And one of the, I guess one of the benefits of certainly happening in a country like the USA compared to Bangladesh is that they have uh, very well funded, very well resourced government agencies, government funded agencies of experts to investigate these sorts of things and everything goes public. Well, I've done other presentations on failures that occurred in the US, uh, one to do with a highway tunnel. And so the one we get to hear about there is the, N, uh, is the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, who investigate any failures to do with anything that involves transportation of anything. Uh, people, roads, railways, airways, uh, pipelines. So it's transportation of materials. But this just being a building, no transportation involved, there's another uh, significant highly qualified government agency called the, NA, the NIST. Uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but the Jonathan National probably knows. Standards and Technology. Standards and Technology. Never remember the S. So they, because it's a, because it is just a building failure, they're the ones doing the investigation for this, and it's ongoing. They actually update on their website, and it's wonderful. So even now, as we're in transit, so we're two years on, I can find out things about that. There's there's no government funded, government resourced agency that gives updates on what happened in Rana Plaza. And this is one of the problems we have with dealing with a, with a developing uh, nation. Okay. We're also not talking about this one, which needs no introduction at all. So definitely more deadly. Uh, 2,800 plus people died when the Twin Towers collapsed. Not an accidental failure. So it was an actually highly, um, highly deliberate terrorist action that caused the collapse of the two buildings. So, but when you combine the two, we're left with uh, Rana Plaza. So totally an accidental failure, which there was seen to be very little warning, no actual action which caused it, and then the number of people that died. So just a little bit of background. So because it happened in Bangladesh, this, this makes a big difference as to what sort of information we get and possibly what contributed to why it is. So there's Bangladesh. So for those who are not really up on all their uh, geography for that part of Asia, uh, it's almost completely ringed by India, goes right up the western side, across the north, most of the way down the eastern side. A little bit of border here with Myanmar. Uh, when we had the plight of all the Rohingya refugees, 
who are fleeing across to gain sanctuary in Bangladesh. It all happened down here, two big enormous refugee camps. So it's just that little bit of border there with Myanmar. Um, so the actual failure occurred in just a part of the outskirts of Dakar. So Dakar is the capital. So just to the west of that is this, uh, this area called Sabah, which is where it occurred. So what else do we know about Bangladesh which contributes to this? So as we see there, cheap labour. So it is one of the emerging nations that is feeding Western demand. This, this, this building that collapsed was vastly uh, used as a factory for the garment trade. A lot of major Western brands, uh, so just as they've done with China and other countries in the past, a lot of them get their, get their garments produced out of Bangladesh where the labour is cheap and it's easy to work and these countries are hungry for foreign currency and foreign investment. And so they open up all sorts of avenues for people to come in there and use that. Just to give you a sense of scale, the GDP per capita there is about 4% of what we enjoy in Australia. So it's a poor country. Of course, there are some at the top end of town who do very well, but for the vast majority of the population, are very impoverished. A lot of financial struggles there as well. Certainly nowhere near the infrastructure and, the, and sort of the welfare systems that we have in Australia. It is the world's second largest garment industry in Bangladesh. Now, this is just an interesting little thing here because this contributes to what we'll be talking about tonight. I looked up the, uh, this has actually been around for quite some time, quite a number of years, the Corruption Perceptions Index. And the, um, the lower the score you get, the more you're down against the poor indications of you know, corruption being either actual or um, the potential for it to occur. So out of the list of 180 nations in the Corruptions Perception Index, Bangladesh sits at 147 with a score of only 25%. And then just the other three is just to give you some idea of where it fits around the rest of the world. Australia's number 13. You get in the green world. It's 75%. It's out of 100. No one gets 100. The top country is Denmark, number one, which is rated at 90. And at the bottom of the list is Somalia on 12%. So this is a measure of all levels of corruption and uncontrolled activity, uh, loss of trust in public authorities and the degree to which they uh, contribute to a civilised society. So Bangladesh has struggles in that front as well. And they have very weak labour laws, which is one of the reasons why it is attractive for a lot of Western countries to go and explore, uh, to, to actually use their resources for what they need. And then they returned to the West and sold at enormous markups to, to consumers here. Uh, other than the technical things that I'm going to be concentrating on tonight, you don't have to search very far on this particular issue to see that there's been a huge backlash within, within the garment industry, within all sorts of other agencies that work with uh, consumer flows of goods around the world to shine a light on some of the enormous problems that occur in countries like Bangladesh or India or in China where they are being used as the actual the workforce for the rest of the developed wealthy Western world. And so often it's out of sight, out of mind. We're happy to reap the benefits, but uh, often the, the costs that go with that um, aren't seen at all. And one of the costs of this is actually what's occurred with this particular disaster. Okay, so what was it? So it was a building. Uh, I've tried to explore a number of papers to get information about this. There's nothing available publicly through any public agency. I've actually had to extract this from a conference paper that was delivered in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, it was actually an engineering conference in 2017, I think it was, by a number of academics. And they just had a couple of little snapshots. There's, there's hardly any information available in any approving authority, in any government instrumentality about the actual details of what the building was supposed to be or what it was. This is just a little snapshot. So this is just a couple of elevations and a section of the building. Even in this one paper that I looked at, which was authored by some academics who should know their way around presenting information, in adjoining paragraphs, one paragraph they talked about it being an eight-storey building, another one they said it was a ten-storey building. There was lots of inconsistencies just within what I thought, thought should have been a fairly academically rigorous paper. So the absence of information of actually well-defined, agreed-upon, available information contributed to what was built and now contributes to our difficulty of actually trying to understand what went wrong. So, um, so anyway, so let's just take it as from the, from the view on the right. So it actually shows essentially a six-storey building plus a basement. So the essential uh, arrangement that had first been proposed for this building 
There's a semi-level basement, which is supposed to be a car park. There was supposed to be three levels of uh, retail on top of that, shops, and then another three levels of office space on top of that. So that's what was in the original plan. Here's actually, and this is also in this, this, this particular paper, the only information that they could show regarding some of the actual original architectural details. So there's a floor plan, uh, basement level on the left, and actually in the retail level further up. Doesn't really show you a lot about the structural form, other than you can see where all the columns are located in, in the lower floor in the, in the basement. You see some, there's, there's some exterior structural walls. But when we're hungry for information, try and understand what went wrong, why it went the way it went, there's just so little to find. So even some of the things that I'm presenting tonight are just the best, best guesswork that I can muster. So what, what was the lead up to the actual collapse? So from 2006 to 2013, there was absolutely uncontrolled development of the site. Um, there had been permits granted, but there'd been no assessment done. A lot of it was done through corrupt practices. The actual owner of the site was politically very well connected, and some of these things just happened because he called people and had strings pulled. There's no records of things being assessed, things being approved, but somehow at the end of the process, a permit gets issued, a permit for construction, permit to accept the details to consider. He was, actually, he was the actual builder for the site. They didn't have a registered builder, so the owner of the site did the, builder himself, did the building himself. So, and there's more details about that coming up, just what the extent of this uncontrolled development really, really looked like. So the day before, the audible cracking of a main exterior wall, I've got a, I've got a little graphic coming up in a minute which actually explains all the things that went on here. So the two lower levels, so there were, remember there was the basement, Three retail, three office, that was on the plan, okay? The two lower retail levels were actually evacuated because they didn't actually have another retail level on the top and they didn't have three offices on top. It was all factories. So here's one of the big things that got out of control. There was actually the what was initially shown on a plan as being the intention. Car park, three retail, three offices. But all of a sudden it becomes a car park, two retail, four factory levels. Now, if those, I can see a few people nodding, you're probably familiar with loading codes. But this, this is what we talk about in the sort of structural world. But for any other engineering discipline, once you often change the purpose or the function or the intended use of something, that changes the design requirements. That changes what you're supposed to do. And that was totally out of control. So anyway, the, the people who are on those two floors of retail space, they, they evacuated. The actual inspecting engineer who came in when they called him in because of this audible crack and these large cracks appearing in the main full height wall of the building, he actually fled the building. So he didn't have a lot of confidence in what he was looking at. But then the, uh, but then the garment workers on those four floors of factory, they were threatened by the owner, the owner of the development. They, they were threatened they had to go back in and work, which they did for that day. And they actually apparently had a press conference there and pointed at things just trying to tell people it was just cracked plaster. Much more serious than that. So on the morning itself, um, so they were threatened with uh, pay forfeiture, but they wouldn't get paid. Well, a lot of them hadn't been paid in the past anyway, but they would actually forfeit a month's wages. And again, a lot of these people are actually impoverished. A lot of them uh, are women, mothers with children, trying to do fairly manual low paid work to try and keep their family units afloat. These are the sorts of people that get exploited in these cases. And, they, and when they made a threat like that, then they just went in and did as they were told. So early morning power cut, as often happens in Bangladesh, so you don't have reliability of supply of services. Electricity failed. So they had, they had generators at, at, on the roof of the building. They started them up, and then they had a total collapse thereafter. So again, diesel generators, not... not small little things, but large machines for generating power for a, for a power-hungry building with uh, four levels of, well, actually more than four levels of factory by, by the time this actually happened. Um, and then later on in the day, there was, a, a, there was actually a fire broke out in the rubble as well. So just an absolute uh, hellish, hellish sort of scenario of what actually went on. Okay. Right, so I'm going to run through just in touch on various things we go through. So the engineering courses, uh, causes that uh, contributed to this as opposed from uh, criminal and, and political causes. So there was the, res 
there was the building's response to the site, or the actual the design in response to the site. We'll see more in the graphic about that in a minute. Uh, compromise of approvals and, and the permit system, which we've touched on. Uh, the compromise of designer integrity. That um, engineer that uh, I mentioned before, who was the one that did the inspection the day before, he was also the engineer involved when they then illegally added another four floors to the building. So the original design was for the, uh, the basement, and then uh, three of retail, three of office. They went and added more floors on top of that, another four floors, without telling anyone, they just did it. This apparently happens quite a lot. And he was the engineer for that. So he was complicit in that. So he was compromised as well. Um, that was a 10 story. Yes. Well, there's actually nine of the. They're actually heading towards the 10th. They're actually building the 9th at the time when the collapse occurred. Just, just when you think it can't get worse, it gets worse. Um, so the uncontrolled repurposing of the building, as I mentioned before, so there's just arbitrarily changing the purpose of floors. I've got a table coming up showing you actually what that actually means in reference to Australian loading standards, what that actually means to the design load you're meant to have designed for. It makes a huge difference to the numbers. You can't just willy-nilly do this. This, this. this is why councils here in Australia, if, if you have a building for which you want to change the purpose of it, maybe from a you know, typical thing you see in the suburbs, it might, be a, it might just be a residential house, and then all of a sudden someone wants to put a doctor's surgery in there or a dentist or something like that, convert it to an office. That actually requires a development application because you've changed the purpose of the building. It changes its assessment under the National Construction Code. It may well change the types of loadings you're required to have. It may change all sorts of things to do with access and egress, fire, fire resistance, all these sorts of things. The changing of a purpose of a building here in Australia, it's highly regulated. That constitutes a development application. But here they just take things out, put things in. Obviously, you know, the demand for Bangladesh to be, to be a manufacturing supplier to the rest of the world has been on the increase. And so people who previously had built buildings, even if he had legitimately intended it for it to be three of retail, three of office, Perhaps all this demand starts coming. Think, well, well, I've got a building. I can get more money out of putting factories in there. So he boots out all the offices and puts the factories in. He did it. That actually changes what you're actually asking the building to do. Okay, so this needs to be controlled. The uncontrolled rescoping of the building. Again, these, these additional floors. So the first stage, there were permits actually granted. Again, with no approvals process, but he managed to pull strings and, and get permits granted. But then the addition of additional floors no documentation for that at all. Okay, sort of things you think you can't believe what actually happened. Can't happen in a country like this, but it does there. But yet these are these are things that actually feed into why it's such an attractive place for Western demand to go to get goods produced and they take them out. We all contribute to this, and there's no professional supervision of design, of construction, of approvals processes as well. It just gets worse. So here's a very helpful graphic. We'll spend a bit of time on this one here. Oh, this is supposed to be. Yeah, it just, just doesn't happen. Didn't happen. Uh, you actually, I don't actually have the list of all the people, but, but by the number of people who have who've actually been lined up uh, with the legal charges as a result of this, the vast majority of them were actually in government instrumentalities. There's a lot of graft going on, a lot of things that just completely white out the entire system. So, uh, very busy little drawing here. So first thing I'm going to start at here is actually when I talked about the building not being designed for the site. Over 60% of the footprint of the building is actually constructed over a filled in pond. So long term, saturated soil, pond, swamp, call it what you like. But any of us who've worked in those areas know that you, I mean, you can do it, but you need all sorts of work to ensure that you've got the adequate strength of performance out of, of long term saturated soils. And not only just the saturation of them, but because it's a low point, it attracts different types of soils. And so there's all sorts of things you've got to do. Um, and you notice, I mean, assuming that this graphic does actually uh, replicate to some extent what actually happened, all the cracks are coming from this area here. So you can sense that this would have been a soft spot. Okay. So, and because there's no design details available to actually say what they actually constructed it, uh, we we probably could suggest that there's no special attention given to actually having that there. And also, if, if you do have a site which has markedly different ground conditions across the footprint of the building, 
that is a significant technical challenge in itself. When you've got uniform conditions across the building footprint, much easier than if you've got, better to have a, better to have a site that is all bad than to have a site that is half bad and half good. Because then you've got this interface between the two and you've sort of got to make the whole thing work as a whole when your founding material has got this such of variation in its properties. Okay, so on the Tuesday, so the 23rd, the day before was a Tuesday, so that's when the cracks all noticed up the back. You notice know, so the change in construction from, so the basement's under here, so this is, this is uh, floor one, two, there's the third floor, fourth floor. That, that was the original part of the development <coughs> there. Um, and when they came on to put the additional floors later on, which, which were the ones that didn't have any, any approvals process around it at all, all of a sudden you find structural wall, structural wall, this one doesn't appear anymore, going up the front. Who knows was in control of that? We don't know. But you'll also see now that we've now got, uh, we had uh, the basement, then we've got retail, retail. What was an office is now a factory. So they've actually got the whole thing. The, the second stage of the design that was proposed, although it didn't get approved by anybody, was to have offices up the full height of the building. Now it's all encroached in and become factories. Okay, so um, that's about the failure there. Also another point here, that the collapse also caused the cave into the neighbouring three-storey building. So that's something that we all have to, that we also have an obligation in structural engineering, not that we design for things to fail, but should they fail, we should ask the question, if it were to fail, what, what would that failure look like? So there's also issues when you're taking into account about what sort of collapse mechanisms you might have. A bit, bit like with fire, you know, one of the main things that we consider with the fire resisting design is actually to stop the spread of fire. So sometimes, uh, like when you look at the design provisions around fire, it's not all about trying to put the fire out. Some of the, some of the main provisions we have is just to contain it. And, and we're actually happy to let the building burn as long as everyone can get out safely, but we want to make sure it doesn't spread to adjoining properties. So you want to contain the damage so it doesn't go elsewhere. Uh, another little point that uh, I didn't mention in any of the previous information is that, again, looking at the workforce in the factories, the uh, vast majority of whom were mothers. They actually provided a nursery on site because they'd have to bring small children with them while they worked, and that was in the building as well. So an un unquantified number of infants and small children killed as well. So it just, it just gets worse. No, that's that'd be that'd be a, that'd be a really obvious question to ask for anything that happened here in Australia. Even those little plan views I had before that paper, no dimensions on them at all. All you can do is just gauge. Well, this one here is probably more of a schematic. These ones back here, uh, all the best you could possibly do is to. Well, I don't know. You don't even get a sense of uh, height. So these ones here, you might be able to just guess. Maybe you know, th you know, three meters floor to floor is a bit of a rule of thumb you see for a lot of multi-storey buildings, but you don't get any comparison between that and this one here is to actually just sort of run your finger over the whole thing to get a size of the sense of scale. Cost, they, massively overloaded. Mm. they must have put columns on top of top of them, like Well, you would hope. Yes. Yes. And the materials? A big uh, yes, well, I'm not actually going to go into that, but there's, there's actually info in, in that technical paper I did find, there was actually feedback about Doing, uh, doing sampling of the concrete and, and the steel. I can see from some of the photos, the amount of reinforcement, certainly in some of these columns, it was, it was frightfully light. It was nothing like you'd expect to see in a building of this scale. So, um, yes. I wish I could actually have more detail to present, but this is actually a symptomatic of such a disaster occurring in a country like this, is there was no information for its design or for its construction, and now there's barely information for us to do any kind of assessment forensically afterwards. So just, you know, for any of us that are doing, or have had done in the past, or got the opportunity to do any work in developing countries, great need for skilled, disciplined, well-organized engineers to do what they do in a country like Australia, to take that to a country like this, if you can get a gig to do it. So I've just done a little bit of a table here showing what's happening with, with the loading, just to show you some of the implications of all these changes that go on. So I've made 
reference up the top. So I'm referring to Australian Standard 1170.1. So that is our main Australian standard for what we call, well, what we used to call, old timers like Patrick and we like to call dead and live loads. But now we have to call them permanent and imposed loads. But we still like to talk about dead and live loads. So some loads which are stationary, like the dead weight of the structure itself. And then live loads are people uh, moving things, could be you know cars and all the rest of it, so they're live loads. And I've just showed in here just extracts of had this building been specified to the Australian standard, these are the numbers that we'd be using for what sort of loads we're putting in. Now what the numbers actually mean, don't worry about it if you're not familiar with how we load things up. But it's all in <coughs> kilopascal. So a kilopascal is, is is what you'd get if you distributed, say, 100 kilograms, you know me on a bad day, on a good day, uh, over a square metre. So a kilopascal, 100 kilograms over a square metre. So this is the loading, the, the typical live loading that we have to put on buildings of all different types of classifications. It's all in our standard here. So the original arrangement of the building, they had, they had a stage one, built 2006, 2007, and they're eventually working their way through this second stage here, which is very, very scant details. What I've shown here is, uh, that's the arrangement of the building. The ones in green are what were the intention to build, but they didn't actually build it at the time. So the green was there. So these last two floors, so, so in the first stage it only went up to the fourth floor, but then at the time of when the failure occurred, the original stage details that were available were showing car park, three retail, the rest was office, but then this is actually what in fact was in there. So they changed that retail into factory, all the office went up to factory. Now the key thing is to look at is just look at the change in the numbers. It doesn't really matter what they are, the KPA, but just, so we've got a two and a half for a car park, so 2.5 2 KPA, that's 250 kilograms. So, so a standard car park loading for just cars in Australia, 2.5 KPA, so we design it as though it's got 250 kilograms, for every square metre, you might think, oh, a car weighs more than that. But when you look at the total footprint that a car occupies, this is not actually for concentrated point loads. This is for distributed loads over entire floors and actually how the structure is going to be supporting the total loads. If you look at the entire footprint of a car to a neighbouring car, then 2.5 kPa, 250 kilograms per square metre, it's, you know, it's in the right ballpark. And plus we apply factors to those when we actually do the design themselves. Okay? So 2.5, so, 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 so we are... We believe that the car park stayed as it was. And I'm just guessing that the nursery might have been down there as well. I don't know. So retail, we have four KPA for retail. So you think about retail means shops. So when you think about what goes into a shop, it's not so much the people. You can get a little bit of people out, but it's usually stock is, is, is the thing that, that contributes to it. It's 400 kilograms a square metre. Okay. And then an office, a little bit more dispersed. We, we designed them here in Australia to three KPA. Once you start putting in a factory, here in Australia, straight up to five. And that's if there's no known specialised equipment, maybe large scale machinery going in, you know, presses, all that sort of stuff. So five KPA. And then if you've got, uh, then you've got machinery in there, what they call uh, non-reciprocating machinery, this is all supposed to be garments. So I'm just assuming just, you know, sewing machines, they are reciprocating, but I'm just saying they're actually lightweight machinery. So, so, so the basic multiplier you actually put for machinery in Australia 1.2, so that five becomes a six. So we had a three, we would have been designing it for a six, double. Okay, and that goes all the way up the building. All these extra floors were never a part of the original design of the building. So you just see the scale of what's actually happened with all these numbers. One of those main structural walls disappeared once you got above the fourth floor. And then they have these generators up on the top. So if you've got heavy reciprocating machinery, the dynamic, and we don't actually know what they had there to actually feed the power supply of the building, but the dynamic factor you apply for heavy reciprocating machining is, uh, is actually another 50%, a 1.5 on that. And also, um, vibrations in structures can be an absolute killer, not only because of the, the actual the, uh, the rapid impacting load you get, but remember, we had half the footprint of this building built on an old swamp or a pond. Usually have soft soils, very fine grained soils, gets down to the, the size of soil particles that, that we call silts. This is the sort of thing Christchurch had trouble with in their, um, in their earthquake. Silts 
are very reactive to dynamic loads. You can actually get an effect called liquefaction. If any of you actually watched what actually happened in Christchurch, the earthquake was bad enough. But what they also had in Christchurch was with all the, all the vibration, all this silt-based material came displaced up through the ground. They had thousands of cubic metres of this silt displaced all through Christchurch. It was an absolute mess. You can find this sort of stuff quite easily, but vibration on silts makes them move. If they're stationary, they can actually take load. You put a bit of vibration on them, then things can sink through them, or they will be displaced upwards. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was some of the, uh, some of the effect of the generators compounded with the cracks that occurred the day before. But see, we, we don't know. All I can do is speculate. But, but you see all these little telltale things of particular soil conditions. You add in a certain type of load, sends my alarm bells off thinking this is something that, that possibly could have happened. And if, and if someone did design for it to start with, it certainly didn't come into anyone's consciousness when they were building it and when they were operating it. So some pretty scary numbers there. So on to some of the legalities now. Um, I'll read it. So I know you can all read, but just so we might get it out there. So those permits that were granted for the stage one were the result of political influence. The owner was very well connected that way. That's actually recorded. Uh, the inspecting engineer, as we said, he actually... Uh, he was, he was also responsible for the engineering design, such as it was, for the additional illegal flaws that were added. Uh, the owner, Sohel Rana, after whom the plaza was named, uh, he was arrested trying to flee to India. He and about 40 others, including his parents, that engineer, and a whole swathe of government officials, they've all uh, been charged with murder. This was back in early on. Uh, and there have been numerous delays which have gone up until just only about a year ago to the High Court, of course. If you want charges like that, people look for all sorts of ways that they can get the system to try and delay, deflect, defer, whatever they can. I mean, they're trying to defend themselves, but they're just using whatever legal tactics they can as they're, as they're entitled to. But in the meantime, so El Rana was uh, convicted of corruption charges. So he actually went to prison for three years. Um, so there was some... So there's some way of actually clipping his wings along the way. Kind of interesting, you've got serious, you know, 1,100 people, murder charges, and they, all these hoops you've got to jump through to get him uh, banged up for murder, but you can easily get him on, on, on corruption. And when I first read that, one thing that came to my mind was, uh, was in relation to the, uh, to the infamous um, American uh, uh, gangster Al Capone. Okay, not famous for tax evasion and ill-gotten gains, but that's what they put him in prison for eventually. They got him in there somehow. A lot easier to get him banged up for tax evasion issues and stuff like that. So the money comes into it. So the ATO, you know, the ATO can actually pursue things like this maybe if it's uh, if, if it need be. So anyway, and the murder trials actually got back underway February 22 last year. So who knows where that's going to go? It takes a while for this information to filter through. This next one's an absolute shocker. So. Financial assistance for the bereaved families, okay, so we can assume that a lot of them would have lost a wife, a mother, infant children. That was actually obstructed by the government. They actually put a requirement on people that if you wanted to make a claim, you, uh, if, if the surviving family members wanted to claim that they had someone who was killed in there, they had to prove it by actually you know, um, um, submitting DNA evidence. Where in a country like this are you going to get the wherewithal actually go and do DNA tests and have the money to do it. And in that particular case, what happened was the US government, the US government stepped in and donated DNA kits for everybody that needed them in this particular case. Such was the, I guess, the shameful outcome of this particular incident and then, and then the attention from the West. They thought, well, we can't just not do anything. So massive aid, not just money, but actually you know, providing things so that they could actually jump through these hoops that the government was actually putting up for those that were bereaved in the meantime. And in the meantime, you can, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but there's been a global overhaul of the garment, garment sourcing industry internationally. And, uh, and a lot of brands are very, very careful now to say where they, get their, where they get their work done, where they get their garments from, and they're very careful to make sure they're not involved in places that have got really bad cred like these ones do. So it's been an awful toll to pay, but things have improved as a result. Uh, a lot more 
Um, there's a lot more better uh, labour laws in Bangladesh now, a lot more unionised laws there, because that's where, that's where unions sprung from, was actually the, the abuses that workers had to suffer. So this is, something, well, this is a huge trigger for something like that as well. So just some key takeaways, I think, for all engineers. Now, I'm, I know there's only probably a handful of us that work in the structural civil game, but I think it's really important that there's things that all disciplines can actually take on something like this. So given that there was uh, lots of issues of corrupt behaviour, people knowingly doing the wrong thing, failing to do the right thing, uh, for all of us, check your character before you check your calculations and your computer. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Those of it that need to be challenged by something like this are not in the room. But sometimes we come across people like this. We have to work with alongside, might be a client, might be someone you have to deal with. And sometimes it can be your instruction, your example, your counsel that can pull people back from the brink. It's important to take those opportunities. I'm not here to be popular. I often say this to myself. I'm not here to be popular, but damn it, I'll be respected for what I do. And I think it's important that we all try and adopt something like that. Um, and also, the saying that I like to say to myself, no something is better than a bad something. No client is better than a bad client. No project is better than a bad project. No money is better than bad money, getting money from the wrong sort of people. And so there is such a thing as actually, as actually a bad job to be get involved in. Okay, so we have to weigh these things up. It's not just a case of a take on anything that comes in. Some things we should treat with a very long, long barge pole. Just be careful with whom you get into bed. If you, get, if you partner up with clients that uh, want you to behave in certain ways, as soon as you get indications like that, it's probably not going to change. The only thing you can change is whether you're involved or whether you're not involved. So we have to make decisions like this as well. And I'd say never fear inspection, verification or third party reviews. I've come across engineers who find it very threatening. I say bring it on. I mean, the more that we can get a second pair of eyes, people that look, you try to foster this sort of collegial environment, but very, very important that, that we get additional expertise involved and, and never dissuade that, I think. It's really important. Last one coming up. Um, never progress past the unexplained or, un or unsolved problem. I did another presentation here in Fees a couple of years ago about a tunnel failure in the USA in Boston. And one of the key failures from that one was they actually had progressive failures of certain components within this tunnel roof suspension system, and they could actually see it gradually pulling out from the roof. They brought people in, they went and did certain tests, and they said, no, it's not my fish, thank you. And they said that, that it actually passed the test they did, so it must be okay. They walk away, and the thing is still partly withdrawing out of the roof. So it was actually what we call a creep mechanism. No one actually did a test for the actual mechanism that was going on. It was totally irrelevant. So they could see things looking like they were failing, and they just walked away and said it's okay. So I think we should always be tenacious to never accept something that's unexplained or unsolved. You have to push on. We might get away with breaking the laws of state, but we'll never break the laws of physics. They will break us. So never. So be very good technically at everything that you do, and always be be, be across the actual the, the 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 science and the engineering of what we're involved in, because it's unforgiving if you get it wrong. You get not what you expect, but what you inspect. Again, another shout out for verification and inspection and to encourage that. So it's all well and good to have expectations and design codes and drawings, but if that doesn't translate into actual real things that someone knows that there is a connection between what was designed and what was built, then it's all just academic theory. That's all it is. And something that uh, which I find particularly, well, I used to say this myself years ago, but something that I really get a kick out of, especially involved in FISA, always imagine one day being uh, cross-examined in court for your actions. Uh, I don't get involved with court-related work much anymore, but that's, that's one of the things, one of the big things for any new members here tonight. We didn't do a shout out for any new members here tonight, but I would say you'll, you'll get no shortage of actually hearing legal input and actually the, the disciplines that actually brings out for us to be better engineers, sometimes through the threat or the, the spectre of actually having this actually outside interrogation of what we do. Just remember that that could always happen at one time. And I think that will uh, do me. Good.
question. All right, Bill. Yeah. Ask. <laughs> I think you're thinking of it, Patrick, so where you go. Has, has anybody had any experience of corruption in the construction industry in Australia and would they like to share any stories? Turn the cat. <laughs> Everything gets turned off now. That's right, maybe. <laughs> 